This is part two of my predictions for 2018, 2019 and 2020. So I started thinking about this whole thing back uh, in July last year and I was thinking of the ramifications for the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn and also the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius. Then I came across this. It was the cover of The Economist for 2017 and they depicted their predictions in terms of these tarot cards. So I was really interested when I began to look at them because I thought, wow, these tap into many of the themes I'm seeing and I'm feeling about what's going to be happening. So I thought it might be interesting to do the rest of my predictions in the second part with reference to these pictures. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the actual tarot cards because these are all, you know, legitimate tarot cards, but they've adapted them. I want to talk about how they present on here. Now, why this is interesting is because the owners of The Economist, they go to Bilderberg and all those sort of things. So if they know, they probably know better what's going on than Joe Soaps like us, who have to rely on you know, the wonderful mainstream media to tell us all their garbage. And that's why I think we need to pay attention to what's, what is on these pictures. Now, why I got interested in them is the very first one, which is called The Tower. And I will leave a link to this underneath this vlog so you can take a closer look at these pictures yourself because I think it's a bit distracting if I keep putting them near the screen to try and show you them. And uh, there's a tower, it's actually more of a medieval tower, and it's struck by lightning, flames coming out the top. So if you live in the UK, you would have known that uh, one of the biggest events last year was the fire in Grenfell Tower. It still rumbles on, lots of political ramifications, etc. And I thought, hmm, odd that the very first card they depict a fire in a tower. Rather interesting. What's more interesting to me is exactly what was happening in the wake of Grenfell. So, in this picture here that's called the tower, on this side they have a group of people marching with the old Soviet hammer and sickle flag. On the other hand, uh, side, they have a group marching with the cross representing Christians. And at the top, you know, the storm clouds gathering. It seems to show a conflict happening. So right in the wake of Grenfell, Jeremy Corbyn came out and he had his kind of Komorovsky moment when he said, oh, we've got all these empty luxury flats in Kensington and Chelsea. Couldn't people from Grenfell go and live there? And it just reminded me of Dr. Zhivago, where Komorovsky comes in and he says, well, this house is so big, you know, it's far too big for one family. They could take at least 27 families. I know it's kind of gone Italian. That all went wrong. Don't worry about my accent. But the point is, they're trying to put this whole kind of communist ethos into people's minds. So a few days after Grenfell, there were protests in the street about the government's handling of it. And I noticed so many of the protesters were wearing around them the red Soviet Union hammer and sickle flag. Now, as a aficionado of flags, as a child, I absolutely adored flags. I had lots of them. I know that that flag was never, ever around, and it never has been up till now. I would have noticed. I would have purchased it for my collection. Not because I believe in communism. And I just think it's odd that it suddenly appears. Who's making them? Who's producing them? Where are people buying them? Suddenly it's being planted into the public psyche, this whole thing. Communism, communism. And uh, the recent surveys on the students in, the in America showed that there are a growing, growing proportion of people supporting communism. Now why? I mean, I thought that was an idea that had died a death back in the 80s. Maybe it's just because I remember the fall of the Berlin Wall. But uh, so often in history and in the media, they talk about the 25 million people that were killed because of World War II and the dangers of Nazism and that whole ideology. But very rarely do we hear about the m tens upon millions of people killed under Stalin, 30 million people, tens of millions killed under Mao in China, more killed under the Khmer Rouge. Then there was the 7 to 10 million people killed when there was the collective punishment against the farmers in the Ukraine, which is a war crime. It was called the, uh, the Holodoma. Sorry if I didn't remember that off the top of my head. But Stalin had death camps. He took up the idea of concentration camps from uh, Hitler and used them. It was an oppressive authoritarian regime that's killed millions upon millions of its own people. And yet now they're trying to rehabilitate this whole idea about communism and pass it off as it's some sort of fuzzy welcoming thing. And I, I notice how they have kind of claimed all these terms when it comes to communism, fascism, Nazism, and have given them all different meanings. So Mussolini was the first fascist leader. 
And the very first person he received congratulations from was Stalin, because Stalin recognised that fascism was just a form of communism. Communism's always been global, fascism is more, more local, more nationalised. Then we have the Nazis, which stands for the National Socialist Party. Again, it's socialism, right? And uh, fascism is a lot to do with what we're seeing in the European Union now, this crony capitalism, this gathering together of the elites to grab power, hold power, get more and more authoritarian and sort of cut themselves off from the rest of us. So it does worry me when they are trying to push this whole communist idea to people who are quite young, impressionable, don't really understand and have not been given the basis through their education system to understand what this kind of structure really means. So I was interested to see that. Now, where this plugs into astrology is the Uranus Neptune conjunction, which happened in 1993, is associated with communism, and it occurs in the sixth house of the European Union, which was also formed in 1993, the Treaty of Maastricht. And that brings me to what I was saying in my previous um, part, these predictions, that communism and the Soviet-style system of politburos and control was always central to the European Union idea, even though they sold it to us as something very different. And right now, this whole Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn is happening very, very close to where that other conjunction happened in Capricorn. It's only four degrees between that. And I see that now as a clash represented by the planets of the ideas of conservatism, libertarianism and capitalism represented by Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn against this whole idea of communism represented by Neptune-Uranus. So what else can we say? Let's get back to this picture. So in my first broadcast I said we hadn't had a Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn in over 500 years. So what was happening 502 years ago when we had the last Saturn-Pluto conjunction? It was the time of Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. Now that's depicted in the card here because they have pinned to the church door of the tower. They have a little note which was significant because that was what Martin Luther did. He put, pinned his note called the 95 Thesis against a church door. And this sort of set off a whole lot of events in Europe which shaped the history. Why I think the whole Martin Luther thing is so relevant to now is that what Martin Luther did is he translated the Bible into the vernacular. So the Bible was suddenly accessible to ordinary people in Germany and across Europe, and this broke up the power the priests had, because people could read the Word of God themselves. They didn't have to rely on all these intermediaries and having to pay all these indulgences to Rome, which had the stranglehold of, over Europe in this Holy Roman Empire, holding everyone down under this authoritarian force. And Martin Luther showed people that they could have a direct channel to God through prayer, through reading the Bible themselves, and that broke down the power of, of the Holy Roman Empire, leading to the establishment of Europe we know today, separation of church and state, uh, root of law, and a lot of important things that led to the freedoms we have right now, and to the different countries and different approaches. So what I say that is so similar to, and resonates strongly with me, of what's happening now, is up until recently, we've had the mainstream media. And they have had a monopoly on the information we receive. So they can cherry-pick the information they want to tell us. They can weaponize it and then bombard us with it until we kind of get the message that we are supposed to get and then act on that. But along has come the alternate media. It's absolutely taken uh, Twitter and YouTube by storm. And suddenly people are getting whole new perspectives on the information out there and it's changing their mind. They're hearing new things. I found that all the mainstream media really do these days is report from official sources. They don't critically evaluate the, the information coming out of governments or out of organizations. They just report it like as is, not putting it through any kind of critical filter. I always see conspiracy theorists or the independent media being a little bit like the defense team at a trial. Because if you've ever watched trials, you know that the prosecution arrive and the police give their side of the story, the prosecutor sets out his case, and you sit there thinking, wow, this guy's definitely guilty. This sounds terribly damning. But the minute the defense attorney stands up and starts asking some key questions and showing the jury how this evidence just doesn't match up at all and how the police were shoddy in the way they collected it, etc., etc., immediately you get a new perspective and you think, well, this guy is definitely innocent. And I think that's the role of the independent media that our traditional media do not do anymore. They don't critically look at these things coming out of government to give you a chance to see, wait a minute, this just doesn't add up. So that's what I think is so important about now is the elites and the media have this control 
of the information we had and they could control our decision making based on that. Who needs a dictator when you've got the mainstream media? Because they're giving you the information and you know, you'll make the incorrect decision based on the information they give you. So just like Martin Luther, by translating the Bible into the vernacular, empowered people and took away the power of the priests and all these institutions which are really about power, not about spirituality or religion. Right now we've got the same thing happening. So where Pluto and Capricorn, Pluto second conjunction in Capricorn gave us Martin Luther, now they give us Alex Jones or Drudge or any Stephen Molyneux, any of those guys you want to think of, any, whichever one is your favourite. What's also important is that after the breakup of the Holy Roman Empire, Europe became lots of separate countries. There was turmoil and wars in, in, until everything settled down and established itself. But I also see this as the breakup of the EU. And just as happened back in Martin Luther's day with the breakup of the Holy, European, Holy Roman Empire. So there's, for those of us who find the EU a big controlling uh, authoritarian Soviet style system, that's definitely something to cheer about. Now. Why do you think we have this conflict represented in this particular um, drawing here between communists on one side and Christians on another? I see this as on one side lining up we have the communists, the elites, possibly the celebrities and the Islamists lining, against, uh, lining up against Christians, conservatives with a small c, libertarians and all other groups. And that is the dividing line we see running through politics um, all over most of the world. And you could ask yourself, well, why? Why are the elites lining up with the communists? What, what are the elites of the world, or the very rich people, the billionaires, why would they be interested in communism? Well, it's communism for us, not communism for them. Communism always aimed to wipe out the middle class, because it's the middle class from which the revolutionaries come. And therefore, if you can knock out the middle class, you resort to a, a distinctly two-tier system where there's no real way up, and where you cement power, you cement control, and I think that's what they're doubling down on this, to absolutely cement their power. Um, why is Islam or Islamism, more Wahhabism, I'd say, lining up on that side, well, it has a lot to do with, a lot in connection with communism, both are highly neo-Platoist in their theories, very totalitarian, very collectivism, a lot of collectivism. They can work well together because they both see things as, as one, like under communism there was no religion because no competition to the state, under Islam you have um, the state is the law, it's the economy, it's the religion, it's the culture, it's totalitarian, so they're both quite similar. However, I don't see this really as a conflict, between a religious conflict, ultimately. The Fabian Society always said that they wanted to go from feudalism straight to communism. They realized they couldn't do that. They knew they had to go from feudalism to capitalism to communism. But capitalism ended up being way, way, way more successful than anyone could have ever imagined. It wasn't that easy to knock out. So they've added an extra step where you go from feudalism, capitalism, Islamism, communism, and it's not because they care about religion or I I the Islamic religion, it's that they're using it as a stepping stone. And I think we all need to realize that and realize that the true enemy is not each other. It's the people up there, the people with the power, and, and we need to unite together and not allow them to do divide and rule, as is being suggested in that picture. Now, that was quite a mouthful. I had an awful lot to say there. So I think I've gone on about that one a little bit too much, but it was incredibly interesting when you linked it back to the whole Martin Luther thing. But I think we'll move on to our second picture. Now, I really don't want to spend a lot on that. The picture's called Judgment. It's got Donald Trump sitting on the world and he's holding symbols of, of, of kind of judgment. I think that was the elite's message that they wanted to impeach Trump and they thought that would happen. I think the whole Russia canard that they've been throwing at us. I mean, who cares? Who hacked the emails? What was in them was what was exciting, but no one's looking at that. So that's passed over. I think the next thing's going to be the 25th Amendment trying to convince everyone that Trump is insane and he needs to be impeached on the grounds of the 25th, which is insanity. As Alan Dershowitz pointed out, he's a Harvard law professor. He advised in the OJ trial, some of you might remember. He said this is a tactic straight out of the Soviet Union. From afar, they would judge someone mad and then they would have them thrown in a mental asylum. Meanwhile, it was just because they disagreed with that person politically. So again, you know, out the Soviet handbook, off we go. The next tarot card, it's called the world, right? And in a loop, we have the symbols of government, of universities, of institutions, of local government. We have symbols representing the media and arts, and uh, that's all, all kind of in a loop. 
but two things are not in the loop. They're kind of being cast off into the sun. And one of those things that are not in the loop is a picture of someone in prayer, it seems to me representing religion, and a picture of the book. So I see that as the Bible and Christianity. They're trying to show that the Christianity is no longer part of the plan. And I think it's because you can no longer control people with Christianity. It also depicts quite clearly how the media work together with celebrities, work together with local government, the universities. They're all kind of on the same hymn sheet. You very rarely hear anything different coming out of any of those institutions. They all seem to be plugged in to the one main goal, which is globalism, isn't it? Along with these communist overtones, which are less talked about. I think uh, I'm reminded when I look at that about what Paul Joseph Watson says about uh, conservatism being the new counterculture and that's again exactly the conservatism of Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn is clashing with this whole little loop you see going in. I think you could whack charities in with that loop. Charities and NGOs, they're all working together towards this same long-term system. I think where Orwell didn't get it quite right is he saw government as being the source of control where now it's private companies like Twitter, Facebook, Google and everything they are censoring people because they're not uh, bound by the First Amendment at well and they're not bound by anything in Europe because we don't have this uh, enshrined right to free speech so it's easy for them to censor. Isn't it funny how all those main companies seem to be on board with the plan? I think it's probably because it's a rigged system and the only reason those people got so much power is because they were in with the plan from the beginning. So now the next card is called the Hermit. Won't be talking too long about this but this is a very interesting one. If you notice all the other cards are set in the day. This is the only one that's set at night. So up on the hill we have someone holding a torch like a beacon and leading. He's got a cloak so you can't really see him. He's like the Hermit. In a valley we have a whole group of people walking and those people have signs like TTIP crossed out. So I'm gathering from that these are the Brexiteers, the Trump fans, the people who are anti-globalists. Now why is the sun setting on them? Because the globalists think that we're done, we're finished. They think what gave us Brexit and Trump, that they've got it under control and that's all over now. And why is the road ahead sort of dipping down? It's like these people are being led into a trap. Now Neptune in Pisces warns of false prophets and uh, false accusers. And I look at that uh, card and I see the hermit who's leading these people with the light. And I wonder if that isn't wolf in sheep's clothing. And I think all of us who are, are, are libertarians and classical liberals and conservatives who want to see an end to this whole globalism thing and the power of the elites have to be careful that we're not being misled by the wrong people. And it's come to light just in the last week about uh, Steve Bannon. Could he have been the sort of hermit person who's not really what he seems to be at, at all? taking money from Miles Quark. I mean, who knows where his allegiances are lying at all or if they just go with the wind. So again, the elites think we're done, we're finished. And that kind of reminded me of Psalm 23. It says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. I think it represents the courage that's needed going ahead in order to uh, overturn this whole system. If you just see there, it's a little picture of the world with a crack going through it. So I think that means the cracks in globalism, but they think we're done. Now the next card is called Death, right? So you've got there, um, Death arrives on the white horse, the skeleton with the scythe and uh, something representing kind of a nuclear explosion. Now Capricorn, um, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction represents many things to do with death from skeletons, corpses, graveyards, tombstones, morgues. And when Saturn and, and Capricorn are together, uh, Saturn and Pluto are together in Capricorn, it represents the colour black. So what do you think of when you think of the colour black? Well, I think of Isis's flag, actually. And when you look back at the last Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn, it wasn't last long after that, in 1626, that the Ottoman Empire was at its absolute height. It reached the gates of Vienna and was uh, only rebuffed by the Habsburgs in Vienna. So I think that Isis hasn't reached its, its pinnacle yet, and that's coming, as represented in astrology and by that card. Now, I know they've been defeated in Syria, but they're strong in places like the Philippines. And the ideology is vibrant when you look at play, things like Boko Haram, al Nusra, and Ultra Barber. I mean, there are many different organizations. It's not just one thing. The ideology is quite powerful, and it, it is growing. And although, when I did my uh, blog on the Manchester attacks, I realized that you don't really have too many attacks, well mercifully we don't have as many attacks in Europe. Most of the attacks that take place are in the uh, in the Middle East and in Africa. So you know Muslims are the 
epicenter of being attacked by this kind of ideology in this group. It was pointed out by someone else on Twitter that they thought this represented sort of Korea launching a missile attack and there's a great nuclear explosion as a nuclear bomb falls in the water and blows it out. And someone suggested that that could represent Seattle being hit by a bomb from North Korea. Now, I don't go along with that. I think that North Korea is more likely to collapse than for a great um, nuclear war to start up. But it's obviously someone else might have thought that. Uh, the fact that they've got the sun in the middle of that is very similar to Imperial Japan's flag and therefore they're definitely representing these events being centered on that particular region, Japan, North Korea. Again, there's a dead fish amongst all the carrion birds and the symbols of death in this card representing the death of Christianity. So once again, they are plugging that theme. I almost think the way we have this mass immigration in Europe, we have a lot of people coming in from totalitarian, brutal regimes who are not used to the level of democracy, the freedoms and the rights that we have. So perhaps that's a way of changing things to, for the globalists think, well, People who already live in Europe, we, we got a bit greedy, you know, we spoilt and selfish, we want our rights, you know, but anyway, these new people are coming, they're not used to the rights, they maybe not expect the high degree of rights that, um, that we do, so I'm wondering if that's kind of the plan. So the next card, totally different, we are now talking about Tor uh, Uranus going into Taurus. So we look at this card called the Magician. And you've got this guy here, he's got one of these kind of 3D visors on his head and a 3D printing machine and he's pressing the button and out of that 3D printing machine you see loads of little houses coming out. Which seems to represent to me that they're going to be finding a very quick new way of producing homes. Now Uranus, Taurus is a sign of the builder, it's a sign of, of building construction. Uranus going into Taurus means lots of new ideas on how to construct, how to build. Taylor Wimpy, which is the big kind of home building company in the UK, said that within 10 years all building sites will be totally automated. Just think of that, okay? Then you've got this new automated bricklaying machine called SAM. It's an anachronism for something. It's SAM. You can look it up. That's a, you know, a robot that does bricklaying. So you can see that that's absolutely on the way. And when Uranus moves out of Taurus, it's straight into Gemini. Gemini is the sign of the car. That's when we're going to see the automated, the uh, driverless car. So this whole thing about AI and automation, it's cranking up first hitting the building industry, next thing will be the transport industry, it's coming and that's what's represented here. I feel what this card also represents is, you know, transhumanism and I see that in the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction at Aquarius where humans begin merging with technology. The whole thing about transhumanism, it's not as weird as you think, it's even on Wikipedia, they've talked about it since 1936. I know that uh, David Icke and Alex Jones did a very good analysis of it when they quoted from many people in Google and Facebook and kind of showed the way the people leading technology actually thinking. Um, I'm thinking that soon, sooner or later we can have sort of chips in us so that we'll be connected to our router or our home hub in the same way our computers, printers, coffee machines and probably our cars will be in this whole integrated system and will probably be more and more technology which can be implanted into the body in order to enhance our performance. There is now a, uh, a supercomputer which can learn in four hours the entire wealth that has ever been collected in terms of chess and chess moves and chess strategy. So it just goes to show the capacity these computers now have. It could be making academics or even um, medical specialists redundant. So it's, it's, it's what is represented by Jupiter, Saturn and Aquarius, which is Aquarius, the sign of technology and innovation, that we are now being on, on this path where technology is taking over us, where we're no longer in control of it, it's very soon going to be in control of us. I think that warrants a whole vlog where I'm going to talk about the Saturn, Saturn, Saturn Jupiter conjunction in Aquarius, what it means in terms of Agenda 31, artificial intelligence, because there's really a lot to say about that. Okay, our second final card there, Wheel of Fortune. This one was kind of on the face of it the most obvious. Strapped to the Wheel of Fortune, we've got someone who looks like Kate Builders with a Dutch flag, someone who looks like Marie Le Pen with a French flag, and they're in the ascendancy, moving up clockwise as the wheel goes like this. There's also Angela Merkel, and she's on a downward trajectory in this picture, being struck by lightning. So obviously the people who concocted this card were well aware that Angela Merkel would kind of be heading on, on the out. Now this Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn, that's going to be affecting a sensitive part in Angela Merkel's chart. So I don't think she's going to be in power beyond 2020. Her days are in effect numbered. I did give a very positive forecast for Marie Le Pen and Kurt Wilders. 
earlier in this year, both of them are now the official opposition. What's more important than that is within the European Parliament, their grouping, where they are together, um, Kurt Wilders, Marine Le Pen, also um, Labour Nord from Italy, the Swedish Democrats, the party who's now in power in Austria, they're all part of one grouping. They're increasing their power in the European Union, so maybe Marine Le Pen and Kurt Wilders are actually expressing their power more through the EU than not, um, you know, through, than through their um, individual governments. So again, they're of course in the ascendancy. Final card here, it's called the star. It's got lots of stars, a comet in the middle, and in between each star, oh in the middle of each star they've got a little picture of what looks like a young person, and at the bottom you can see what's made out to be the red planet full of craters, that's Mars. So when there was lost a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in 1405, soon after that, well it wasn't so soon in today's terms, but then in those days things, you know, had a long space when they sort of rolled out. But it was the beginning of the exploration, people leaving from Europe to discover America, Africa, South America, great period of exploration. And I see we now will be embarking on a new period of exploration, but this time in terms of space. I think what that represents there is a lot of celebrities who might be now heading off onto space and regular trips into outer space, maybe even a Mars mission which is based around people born at the time of Halley's Comet, like 1986, so people who are sort of 32 years old, around that age, getting ready to go on a Mars mission. I definitely see space travel being indicated by this. Um, apparently if you look on uh, Google Maps you can see pictures of Mars where there looks like they're compounds and facilities with solar panels, it's quite interesting. I think what many people when they think of space travel, they think of you know jumping in your car and riding up the motorway to a different town and it's not really like that when you space travel in reality, it's more like changing the radio station on one of your old AM, FM radio waves where you, you are on one like 10.89 a.m. you're listening to Talk Sport, as soon as you move that dial, Talk Sport ceases to exist and there's absolutely nothing until you reach the next station, which comes alive, and then you can listen to everything there. And that's because real space travel were based on what was going on in the Philadelphia Experiment, the Montauk Project, it's electromagnetic frequency by vibration differentials between different planets is how you travel between them, so by changing your own kind of vibrational frequency, which I believe is probably already being done at places like CERN, to create wormholes to these other planets. But I'm sure it'll be sold to us as, you know, people hopped on board a craft and disappeared for two years until they eventually got to Mars. But I definitely see that as a possibility, and we'll tie that into what I said about India discovering water on the moon. So moon exploration on the moon could start in becoming the thing again after many years, well, since Kennedy, you know, no one's been bothering too much with the moon. So that's what the cards say to me and how it ties into the astrology. I hope I've been, hope I've managed to go through it all. There was a lot. Oh yes, I did want to talk about the um, Saturn-Pluto, the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction in, Euro in Aquarius being a lot linked to this whole cultural Marxism and all that that we're going through. But I think we've talked quite long and hard about all the events, quite a lot to digest. So off the back of this, I do want to have a look at North Korea at uh, Iran, just to see what's going on in those countries, because as we talked about, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction is likely to be having a lot to do with the destinies of those different countries. Also, what might be happening in Europe, the European community, and uh, the UK in terms of, um, you know, will there be another election, how's Brexit going to pan out? There's an awful lot to be looking at, and uh, I hope I've given you a good flavour of everything that I think has been going on now, the themes, the conflicts, and we'll definitely revisit these in, uh, you know, in some detail during my other vlogs. Thanks guys, and I wish you all a fantastic 2018.